Good morning and uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Doruk Schenkal. I lead the motion sensors team uh, at uh, Meta. And my team is responsible for uh, shipping uh, motion sensors for all uh, AR, VR, and wearable products. So uh, now we have a panel on uh, sensors in uh, Metaverse. Um, I will first introduce our panels, uh, and then we will have a little bit of uh, discussion, guided discussion uh, about certain topics. And then I will open the forum for questions from all of you. So if you have a uh, question in mind, uh, when the time comes, please line up uh, at the microphones, and then uh, we can go from there. So Mike doesn't need introductions. Uh, he's our keynote speaker today. Uh, and then I will uh, go in order uh, with Sahil. Um, Sahil Chaudhary is the Director of uh, Product Management, uh, Motion Sensors at uh, TDK InvanSense. Uh, Sahil, do you want to uh, say a few words about uh, what you do? Sure. Uh, thanks, Doruk. Uh, so yeah, I work at TDK as Director of Product Management for Motion Sensors. Uh, a key interesting part of, of my role is uh, managing the smart motion sensor product line. Uh, which basically takes care of wearable, curables, AR, VR markets. So a very fun space uh, to be in. I also look after the software solutions uh, for motion sensors, which is now becoming a very key differentiator in, in our markets. Uh, thank you. Um, Neil Trevet is a VP of Developer Ecosystems at NVIDIA. Uh, Thank you. Uh, that's my day job, and, that, and I have three jobs, but that's the only one that pays. <laughs> I, I've been involved in standardization uh, a long time. I'm president of the Kronos Group, which is a standardization organization that um, gets involved in metaverse type things, 3D graphics and OpenXR for augmented and virtual reality. We're doing a new camera uh, hardware uh, API, and Kronos recently initiated the new metaverse standards forum, which is, I think, why I'm here. Um, uh, which is encouraging interoperability for the um, metaverse. And about we were formed six months ago. And much to everyone's surprise, we're now at 3,300 organizations. So. Francesco Doda, uh, he's the director of IoT Sensor uh, to Cloud Applications at ST Microelectronics. Nice to meet you. Um, so I work out of Boston. I uh, direct a technical team um, in uh, the region of America that is responsible of uh, supporting all our customers in the consumer market, industrial market, and automotive market with uh, our, uh, the ST sensors, all ST sensors. And all, we also take care of, uh, of the software that goes around of, uh, those sensors, uh, so sensor fusion and embedded artificial intelligence up to the connectivity with the cloud. Thank you. Christian Peters is the Director of Global Head of Smart Sensors and Hardware Systems at Robert Bosch. Okay, this works. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invite to discuss this interesting topic and this uh, great round here. Yeah, my name is uh, Christian Peters. Uh, um, my background is in MEMS uh, and sensors and also in the field of embedded AI. And uh, I'm a little bit of an, an odd here because um, I'm coming from corporate research. So we are typically working on topics which are five to 10 years down the road mm -hmm. compared to the products that we have on the market right now. Um, I'm responsible for a strategic portfolio within Bosch Corporate Research, and we are dealing with smart sensors, smart systems, um, human machine technologies, like the uh, light drive uh, Bosch Sensor Tech was announced, uh, announced the CS, uh, I think it's three years ago, two years ago now. We're working on uh, um, AI hardware accelerators using techniques like a memory compute and also one of the big bets, which is uh, quantum sensors. And I'm pretty sure this is a topic we will come back later during this discussion, how quantum sensors can help us to make the, the metaverse real. Thank you. Candice is a research manager at Meta. Hi, my name is Ken. I'm research manager at Meta. <laughs> um, I manage another team uh, focused largely on micro actuators and MEMS technologies. Um, uh, my, my team sort of sits uh, in between product and, and basic research. I have a long basic research background, so um, looking at technologies that, that can bridge that gap. And my focus and my team's focus is more on the optical side of things. So um, the different different ways you can use sensors, microactuators for uh, different display applications, things like that. Thank you. Thank you very much for all being here. I think this is going to be fun. Um, so the, our topic will be more on 
um, opportunities and challenges uh, in the sensor space for uh, you know, making metaverse reality. Uh, but uh, before we dive into the topic of sensors, I want to talk a little bit about uh, experiences. Uh, Mike showed uh, really, really interesting use cases and experiences uh, during his talk. So I want to ask each one of our panelists, what is your uh, you know, dream experience? If you know, metaverse to become a reality, you know, what are you looking forward to uh, doing first? And I will start with uh, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Doric. That's a that's a good question. Uh, I think for me, and I think I mentioned this in my talk. Um, so when I was before I came to Meta, I was in Boston, and I worked at um, among other places the the Media Lab at MIT. And there's a um, there's a, a a demo that you can that you can see if you if you go to the Media Lab, anybody can see it, and it's the so-called Princess Leia holographic video display where they actually built we actually built a like a full um, like a full-sized holographic video okay and it's it's incredible right it's, it's this is you know it's it's about the size of I don't know this entire stage right but it's it's what you think of it's what I think of when I think of um, when I think of uh, augmented reality and, and I think of augmented calling, right, as sort of the cornerstone use case or experience. So that's what got me motivated uh, to join Meta in the first place. And that's what I hope to see uh, someday. Okay, so for me, um, uh, a huge, I'm a huge proponent of uh, mental health and meditation. Uh, so for me, a, a very important experience would be uh, to create the perfect meditative environment uh, you know, maybe next to the beach, listening to the breeze. Uh, you know, with with people with people around, uh, with people around meditating with you, uh, and and sensors can play a very key role in that. You know, you could have droplets of water touching you. You could have touch sensors or haptics to enable that. Uh, you could have uh, ultrasonic to make sure everyone's positioned together, chanting together, meditating together. Uh, maybe biosensors to to see if you're doing a meditation well. Uh, and I just feel that that experience of, of bonding with so many people with, with different mental health issues and putting them all in a room uh, together, uh, I think that's, that's uh, my dream experience. I think I would express it not as a single experience, but as a kind of a platform, augmented reality. And, and many of us here, I think, have been working on augmented reality for a long time. I think the, we have a dream, which may be, take a while to, to come into fruition, but I think Sensors are going to play a real important part, and I, th I think the, the 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 essence of why people are so interested in the metaverse right now, because there's a lot of hype, and no no, no one really knows what it is, um, but at its core, it's bringing together multiple disruptive technologies: 3D, simulation, um, XR. So there's some Web3 in there. All these different things come together, but I think AI is really the magic pixie dust, and you spread magic pixie dust on top of sensors, you're going to enable what I call a semantic sensing, which is, you know, you take a, a, an augmented reality experience, you're looking inward at the user and some of the codec avatars that Michael was showing earlier, and you can actually go even deeper eventually and go get emotions uh, and intent, not just the graphical representation. And the outward sensing of the environment can be semantic too, um, not just a depth sensing so you get occlusion, but figuring out what the lighting is, which is a really difficult problem. Again, AI, I think, could be really enabling for that. So at some point, we're going to have augmented reality experiences where the augmentations are truly indistinguishable from um, reality. That's my dream. Thank you. So I had two, actually. One is more trivial. Uh, uh, and the other one is a little bit more, uh, I think, important. So the trivial one is, uh, I'm a soccer fan. I would like to see the next World Cup, uh, really, every single game from my couch, sitting in, in, the, in the middle of uh, you know, a real stadium and so on. But that's, that's just because I'm a soccer fan. The second one, I think, is more, you know, what I see the use of um, um, uh, the, this technology to really accelerate innovation. Um, as I see, for example, we, uh, 
we're working right now, we develop two of our factories are already a digital twin. So we can look at all the data they are collecting from those factories and we can try to predict what is happening in the fast in order to have uh, um, operations that are actually where we're saving costs in terms of CapEx and so on. But we're still looking at data that we collected in the past to predict the future. I think the opportunity with the um, AR and VR is also to take a, a step forward and try things. Um, really with um, in the factory uh, uh, using those data, but also having people uh, in the factory trying new things. This can accelerate the, develop, the development of projects in a safe place uh, where you can take risks that otherwise you couldn't take and, uh, and really accelerate this, the, this type of development. So as a researcher, the, the simulation of uh, new uh, things in a safe place where you can take all the risks as you want, I think it will uh, be the, the exciting part, really the exciting part. Christian? Yeah, um, for, for me personally, um, what, what Michael, what you described in your, uh, in your keynote was really connecting to family because I live 6,000 miles away from most part of my family. Um, and everyone, if you look back, let's say pre-pandemic, we had Skype. We talked to each other on the phone. Then we had video calls, and it really boosted already our experience. Huh? And if we now have like this real 3D environment where you can really feel, hey, you're sitting on the same table like your parents, uh, like your family and friends, I think this will really boost it. On a professional side, I want to echo a little bit what, what you just mentioned um, about the digital twin in the fabs, yes, but also in the, let's say, healthcare. Huh? How can we use digital twins of ourselves to, to boost healthcare, to... Um, make better healthcare and personalize the healthcare, especially to our needs. Okay, <clears throat> the uh, the experience we're most looking forward to. I think it's probably um, being able to look people in the eye, and I think you can you know leave it to an engineer to say I need a new tech gadget to be able to look people in the eye. Um, but no, right now, right? What does what does everybody use? You use your smartphone, right? And so you have to choose. Am I, am I sort of looking out at everybody else or am I looking at my phone? And a lot of times people are just looking at their phone, but once we're able to develop this fully immersive, you know, AR technology, AR headset, you don't have to make that choice anymore. Now you can actually like look at people and talk to them and, you know, you can have augmented, augmented uh, labeling or if, if you forget people's names a lot, right? Um, I know some some people have trouble with names, and okay, well, there, it just it tells me who that person is, and it's even easier to have a conversation going forward. And so um, having that, that truly immersive experience where it's no longer, I'm, I'm looking at my, my handheld device, it's, it's just, it's all incredibly seamless, and it just, it just happens naturally, and you're, you're not thinking about it as much. That's probably what I'm looking forward to most. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, metaverse is, you know, when we think about it, it's this umbrella of technologies and experiences, uh, right? And uh, Neil said something very interesting, right? Uh, uh, no one knows what it is, right? And I think it will take some time uh, to figure that out, right? Um, and as Mike said during his talk, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Uh, and uh, metaverse also needs uh, time, right? It needs time to build these technologies. So for, as sensor technologists, my question is, uh, you know, what are the remaining sensing challenges to make metaverse a reality, right? Um, and I want to start with uh, Ken uh, this time around and come this way. Do I have time to think of the answer now? <laughs> um, <laughs> way to put you on the spot. Remaining sensor challenges. Um, you know, I think you talk to this uh, academic audience, um, the first thing that's often going to come to mind is, how do I sense this new type of thing? Or, you know, what's, what's the new fundamental core science that's going to give me this new break? Um, what I'd actually like to mention, you know, to this audience is um, looking, you know, another, Mike had talked over and over again about the swap C, right? Size, weight, power, cost. And you, you know, you, you pay a price for every, every sensor you develop. So what is it gonna give me and what does it cost me? Um, and if you, you saw how many devices were going into the headsets that he talked about in the Quest 2, um, and if you sort of you know, think about taking that further and further, are, are we just gonna pack more and more sensors into this headset and use up more and more power? Um, I think 
a good thing for this audience to think about is how, um, how can we do more with less? Right? How can we think about develop? There are a lot of challenges we have right now, things sensors are doing, and it could be improved. It could improve upon swap C performance. But are there ways to develop a single sensor that could replace multiple different sensors? So we've got fewer and fewer in there. And you know, then you have the added benefit of being able to amortize the, the swap C cost of eight or 10 different sensors into, into one sensor or two sensors. So. Um, another way, what, what I see is we, we have this uh, huge amount of sensors in there, and I agree with you, if we can use less, would be good. The other way, if you look in the system right now, what is the dominating part? It's usually the battery. This thing is basically a battery uh, with tiny little sensors around it, maybe some optics and what else um, we need. Um, so the whole challenge about um, saving power, reducing the power consumption, uh, is a big issue. And uh, a big challenge, and um, the way I see it is um, we need to um, bring in more intelligence. We bring, need to bring the intelligence closer to the source, which means basically into the sensor. Because if you, if you face it, most of the time our sensors, they are measuring noise because I'm not doing anything which I would need for the classification at the moment. Uh, and this sensor gets moved from the sensor, digitized into an application processor, and then the algorithm kicks in. So we are moving a lot of data, and moving data is really, really expensive. It's way more expensive compared to the calculation. Uh, and this might, uh, if we move the calculation part closer and closer to the source, to our transducer element, then we can save power. Uh, and we only send the metadata, okay, what kind of uh, classification is going on, for example. This will also help us, um, and it's one of the key challenges, how to run an algorithm, which are usually developed in the cloud, because if you talk to a machine learning guy, they always think about cloud, resources is not an issue. We have a lot of issues with resources, um, so we have to boil them down. And this is also one of the challenges. So I, I definitely agree with, uh, with the comment. So the, the, the three key elements always when we talk about sensors that are challenging are, of course, uh, accuracy, the battery power, and, um, and then, of course, the cost that we mentioned before. And, uh, and then when we talk about accuracy, we look into this, the accuracy of the sensor itself with all the drifts and so on, but also the bandwidth that the sensor can offer. And then, as we mentioned, you know, we don't need to move all the data in um, the main microcontroller. So kind of rephrasing what, what, what you're saying. So bringing more intelligence and making sure that the that, that intelligence that we bring in the sensor doesn't have a cost in, term, in terms of um, the battery and performance. So the more the more we can do within the sensor, I think that's the effort that all of us were trying to, to put in there. The more we can do within the single sensor, the more we can distribute that intelligence. And and uh, and of course, we take, take advantage of, of uh, this distributed intelligence from the cloud down to the sensors. There are things that we can do at a very high level, collaborative with, uh, within more sensor, more products, let's say, from the cloud. If we move down into the single platform, same story. We can move. We can use uh, different sensors, and that's an, uh, different um, intelligence uh, within the sensors. So that's an important part. And the other part is um, how can we leverage on that single component to do more? Really, that's that's really the the key part. Can we, for example, do biometric with uh, an IMU directly, uh, adding adding certain capability to the IMU? Uh, in order to sense also other effect. And then there is another important part. How do we bring all this data together in a meaningful way, which basically means uh, most of the time with the right timestamp. So otherwise we get into the issue that uh, Mike was mentioning before of motion sickness and so on. How do we coordinate all those data together? So having that um, precise timestamp, that shared clock together among all those devices, that's also, also the, other, uh, the other important part. Um, and I think those are all challenges Challenges that are um, feasible to address in the future. Uh, Mike mentioned another thing that was important before. This market is unique, has unique, um, of course, needs and requirements, and that's where we, uh, where we need to work together to address them. Yeah, very, very interesting. I mean, I, just to pick up on the, the AI thread again, because it could potentially solve some of these problems. Um, and 
and the question was, what are the challenges? I, I think you know, the sensing community is at, at the th threshold, or maybe we're already in in the, one of the biggest opportunities for disruptive change with with AI. Um, you know, the, I work a lot in vision processing. That has been completely transformed in the last five to ten years with with AI. It's unrecognizable speech. Um, audio, text to speech, I mean, everything has been transformed. And this, I think we're just at the start of this. And it could be one tool that we have to you know, reduce the number of sensors we need. You know, there is research on taking a single picture and hallucinating a 3D model that's actually quite usable. I mean, and um, AI on at the sensor potentially is is exactly what you're saying. I think is correct. So, so and actually to, for this, if you if you kind of believe in AI, the challenge becomes how are you going to get enough inferencing power at low enough battery <laughs> uh, to actually uh, use some of these techniques. So uh, when I think of of metaverse, actually a few years ago when we thought of uh, VR and AR devices, uh, the the goal was performance. You know, the goal was get the performance as as better as possible, reduce the noise, improve the temperature stability. So VR was always a very high performance market because you can't afford to have the smallest gyroscope drift, especially when you're tracking your head orientation. But now, and, and when we thought of variables and hearables, the goal was on-chip intelligence, um, uh, low power, low power axle, low power gyro, low power everything. But now that as the metaverse is evolving and things are getting smaller and smaller, you have to combine these two worlds. We need to make sensors that give you that high performance, uh, still keep improving on those numbers, and still get you the low power. And that, that trade-off is going to be very interesting. And how you can make a sensor which can get you the best of both worlds, because you still can't compromise on performance and it's still going to improve. So that's always going to be a challenge for our engineers. And you have to make sure that you can keep the experience lasted for a long time. So that's why a lot of focus, as everyone said here, on-chip intelligence, low power is going to be a huge new uh, feature that we can add uh, in, our, in our sensors. Yeah, thanks. I, I heard the original question is, what new sensors um, do we need? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's talk about the current sensors. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think with, with respect to current sensors, I mean, I think the, the panel has largely touched on, on the main issues, right, which are around optimization. Um, and you know, we can think of, you know, there's a degree, there's a spectrum of optimization. And when you get to extreme optimization, you're, you're basically making a new sensor at that point. Um, and, you know, what, what's been touched on so far on sensor compute, right, so bringing bringing the computation onto the chip itself so that you don't have to shuttle off, you know, bits of information which cost power and, and, and uh, uh, you know, cost latency, for example. These are, these are big challenges. Um, uh, when you, you know, when you, to, to a large degree, most of these, most of these um, problems, right, are a function of the, of the laws of thermal physics, right? So when you shrink things down to the you know size of a pair of eyeglasses, there's only so much heat that you can dissipate, right? That's your budget. That's your that's your power budget right there. Uh, and so you're you're in this really really strange regime where you have very very high performance requirements that you find in other industries, but you can't burn a you know even a fraction of the power, right? And I think the other thing that's really important to remember here, you know, and I look around the audience and I see, I see many people wearing eyeglasses. Um, I don't want to wear a pair of eyeglasses if I don't have to, <laughs> right? And, and I, think, I think that's true for most people. And what that means is that the experience has to be compelling enough, right, to the consumer that you are willing to put on a pair of eyeglasses. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet, right? It needs to be compelling enough. It needs to be comfortable enough, right? That uh, you can interact with the world in a truly passive, in a truly passive way. And so I think that there's a there's still a big delta and there's still a big gap. Part of that is around sensor development, but obviously there are a myriad of technical issues that need to be solved. So, yeah. Um we talk a little bit about 
sensors and current platforms and current experiences. Um, I guess the next question is what other sensors can we expect to find on these platforms in the future, right? We have IMUs, we have cameras, we have a number of you know, sensors on the existing devices. What can we expect to find in five years or 10 years? And I will start with Mike since he already alluded to the question a little bit. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, uh, what new sense? Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? I mean, I think um, it's a two-part problem, right? Uh, how do you optimize existing sensors? We've talked about, we've, we've touched on that. I think for this audience in particular, you want to know what are the new things? What are the new sensors? Um, and when I think of like, you know, if, if you take the limit, okay, and you just, you don't go scale down hourglass, you scale up, right, to a really big headset where you have much more power budget. Um, you scale up to you know a laboratory size setup. Uh, is there anything? Is there anything that you still can't do? That's how I think of like what are the new sensors, right? Uh, and I think I think the first one that comes to mind is something that I mentioned in my talk, which is a depth sensor, right? That is, you know, like essentially. Um, has the performance, right, of, of something you might find in the automotive industry, like a LiDAR-based system, which is really sort of the, uh, uh, the gold standard, but something that uh, can be productizable in a wearable. And that's really, really challenging to do, right? And there's only so many, there's really only so many uh, uh, solutions here, right? So direct time of flight, for example, uh, you know, a, a direct time of flight sensor that's extraordinarily high resolution, okay? Um, is, is an example of maybe a new sensor that I certainly haven't seen yet. Uh, that would be, I think, hugely beneficial uh, for the use cases uh, that I mentioned. So I think that's the, that's the one thing that comes to mind that we don't have today. Everything else, you know, uh, you know for the most part, we have the sensors to do. The question is, how do, you, how do you optimize it to fit into that glasses form factor, right? And how do you deliver uh, some of these intrinsic features like contextual AI, for example, I think that, that Ken mentioned, um, and some of these other things, that is that involves a lot of optimization and a lot of, I think, iterative development of existing sensors, uh, but truly new and different sensors. Uh, the first one I can think of is DTOF. Um, there are others, right? And there will be others, ones that we're not even aware of yet as we build these products and we and we see what the what the customer really wants. I alluded to that in the presentation, right? Looking beyond silicon, for example, uh, looking into the infrared, uh, you know, short wave, mid wave, that kind of thing. There are probably, there are probably a host of other technologies uh, that I think uh, would provide a lot of value, right? But I think, I think DTOF is probably the one that, that I, would, I would key on today. Okay, so the way I think about this problem is what are the pain points, as Michael said, right? What are the pain points that we're still yet to solve? Um, what are the new issues or problems that we still can't? And, and few things come to mind. Uh, one is the, the, the smile detection or, or the facial emotions. Uh, today you can do that with a camera, yes, yes. Uh, but that takes a lot of power, a lot of bandwidth, a lot of time. Could we think of sensors, which could be a good combination of maybe biosensors, which correlates to when you smile, because maybe there is a, there's a change in your mood, uh, or maybe, maybe a combination of biosensors and microphones, maybe because you make a sound when you smile, uh, and that could be maybe correlated to some facial muscle movement, which could be using a motion sensor. So there could be interesting combinations of sensors, which could be lower power, and still solve uh, a newer problem like this at a, and, and, and lower power will be will be a very important factor. Um, another pain point that that comes to mind is is full body monitoring. I mean, today we've we I think mastered uh, hand and head monitoring pretty well, right? We have uh, good sensors, IMUs, and, 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 and cameras doing that. But how about let's suppose you're doing a dance and and you're doing a freely rapid, maybe a Bollywood dance number, uh, and you're doing all these different movements, how can you track that? Do you need flex flex sensors all across the body on flex PCBs? Uh, what kind of motion sensors you might need, and how will this synchronize amongst each other so that you can get that complete full body dancing imitation maybe? So those are two interesting problems I think that we, should, we could think of uh, in terms of solving. 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. And you know, to to enable solutions to that kind of problem, we we need good de development tools. And you know, I, I I I know I'm the AI guy here. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not a sensor guy. So, I, but the um, it's it is fascinating uh, right now. There's a whole ecosystem. This has really just sprung up over the last twelve months or so of people beginning to source trained models for various use cases and sensor fusion. I think is going to be a great example. Uh, you can go out there and you can you know, download uh, trained networks so you don't have to because no training is the expensive part. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be commercial uh, vendors uh, too. But also the tools are beginning to appear where you can begin to mix and match these trained models. There's all kinds of domains, medical and, and automotive. I know, know there's later today we're going to be hearing more about that. Uh, but you can bring these models together, optimize them for your particular use case, and you know, deploy them uh, qu quite easily. I, I do have sympathy with Michael. You, you're fighting a good fight. The wearables is the most demanding platform, but there are digital pla no, there are digital twins. There's automotive and there's medical that have less uh, extreme power constraints. P perhaps that's where these kinds of techniques will first you know, be, be proven. Thank you. So one thing that still resonates with me is that do more with less. And that less is usually the power, thermal. So how do, how do we make sure that we can bring all, the, all the, um, the experience without actually compromising uh, the thermal management of uh, a unit? Again, if we look at the phone, everything is done pretty much by the main processor. And we all have the experience that when we do a lot, that, that things actually is pretty, pretty hot. Um, so we, when we look at sensors, um, there is probably more that we can do if we just use more sensors rather than just the main processor uh, to, to do things. So, and I'm looking specifically into um, certain field. Um, for example, at ST, we're working right now with uh, um, electrostatic, sensing the electrostatic field. Can this, for example, help some corner cases um, when we try to feel what is happening um, outside. Or for example, presence. Um, I try to understand how different bodies in my field of view can actually um, generate heat. Maybe we can also try to understand the feeling of other people with the remote temperature feeling, and that's another part. Or um, if you look at other fields that are still need to be explored a little bit more, uh, we were talking about the emotions before. Um, I think the, if you look at electroneurography, electromyography, those are fields where there is a lot actually still to do. And can we bring those pieces of technologies um, into some of the sensors that we already have without compromising too much the power consumption? So the, uh, that's really the, the other, I think, important challenge. Because if we can bring all of those novel type of sensors within... Um, within the existing sensor itself without compromising the power. That's a re the real challenge. Uh, and, and then we use, of course, properly AI. That's the other important ingredient. Uh, we can probably challenge, take a lot of the use cases that today require a lot of uh, power and then create the, the issues with the thermal management, um, addressing that part. So more sensors or more sensing element in different fields in order to, to reduce um, what is really burning a lot of power today, which is the main, the main controller and probably the camera as well. So can we do more without using continuously the camera? Can we duty cycle more, um, just sensing more the, the, the world outside there? And I think there are those few, few examples that I mentioned before could be a good point to start. Um, of course, with your question, what happens in five to ten years, you triggered me. So let's go a little bit crazy for the next couple of minutes and talk about um, what can be really as a vision on the road down the street. And uh, uh, one topic um, which I think is, is, is extremely important is right now um, with the first AR glass, we have a good way to get information from the glasses. Uh, but how are we communicating back? So, Michael, in your video, you had this cool little touchpad where you can scroll around to get the, the, the next app or whatever. Um, this is one way. But in, in my vision, I don't need to get in my pocket, get my phone, or get this touchpad out to tell the glasses what I want to see next. So how can this work? 
we all know that audio is not really a good way because there's privacy issue and you don't want to sit in a, in a train and talk to yourself or talk to your, to your glasses. So we need to find other ways. And one way could be a brain-machine interface. So we know that we can measure the magnetic fields of the brain. Right now, we can do it with uh, um, some yeah, devices which has to be uh, cooled down to almost uh, zero Kelvin. And no one wants to have it around the set because it might be not a pleasant experience. So we need to have extremely sensitive magnetometers working at room temperature. And of course, need to fulfill all the requirements about size, about costs, um, about power consumption. Um, and one way to do is are actually quantum sensors. So why is a quantum sensor such a great sensor? Because instead of uh, manufacturing our sensor element, what we do right now in our MEMS fabs, honestly, they're never perfect. There's over-edging, under-edging, there's variation over the wafer, so it's, it's a bit messy always. Um, if you go to quantum sensors, your measurement element is an atom. And there's nothing like a 99% atom. They're all perfect. So the only error that we are making is by the readout circuit. But our measurement element is really good. And this can enable us to really build um, magneto, uh, mag uh, magnet sensors, uh, which are in the Pico-Tesla per square root uh, hertz range. And this will be a range when we can really start thinking about readout simple information out of our brain. We will not be able to write a, a complete uh, um, text message or email, eh? but maybe a simple interaction, left, right, up, down, this should be possible, and this is what we see right now. And the way we can do it, we're using um, basically diamonds, which have a nitro nitrogen uh, vacancy. And uh, if we pump up some, some uh, um, uh, laser light to a higher um, uh, level and add some uh, um, microwaves to it, we can get the so-called uh, uh, Siemens split, which depends on the uh, external magnetic field. Uh, and this is what we can see. But now there's still a lot of uh, challenges. How can we make it small? How can we make it uh, power efficient when it fits at one point in the glasses? But for me, 10 years down the road, I don't want to pull my phone out of my pocket. I want to think about what I want to see next. Uh, okay. Um, a, a couple things came to mind. Um, one is, you know, thinking about the applications, the end applications we want to enable, right? And Mike showed a, a ton of good applications. So, like, where am I? What what am I looking at to determine, you know, what sort of content is relevant? How am I interacting with that AR system? So hands, face, you know, arms, head, everything. Um, and to a lot of these, as Mike alluded to earlier with the hockey puck comment. Uh, to to most of these, we're not at a loss for what are what are all the different applications we need to be going after. Like we we have a, a good set of those right now, um, and there there may be ways to actually do that. Um, you know, for different industries, uh, automotive things like that. But um, you know, there's a set of sensors we have now that we could do some subset of everything we want to do. But down the road. You know, looking at what we have now and figuring out, everybody's talking about power constantly in this, right? Size. Um, down the road, we want things to look smaller and smaller. Um, and so the, the question is, how do we, we're doing all these things now, but how do we do that with something that's much smaller, much lower power, um, weighs much less, right? You can't have a 10-pound pair of glasses on your head. Um, and so thinking about ways that you could you could address those issues um i think i think is really important and then i guess to answer your question a little more directly um as a display guy one thing i'm interested in is sort of augmented vision down the road so um you know maybe not for the day just walking around hanging out with your friends but maybe if you're near, you're in the middle of surgery or something putting on a specialized pair of glasses and you have all sorts of special you know uh, special sensors that can then combine all of that information into the display and so you can overlay you know all sorts of stuff beyond just the visible spectrum and into, into what you're seeing but right. great discussion great discussion really exciting uh, use cases across the board um at this point i want to see if there are any questions from the audience um i know you've been listening um yeah please andre uh, that's super exciting uh, uh, it was partially answered this question. Um, 
we typically, we used to uh, use SWAP, uh, size, weight, power, it was military metrics. Uh, now we added SWAP plus C, so it's cost. But it seems like uh, P performance never makes into this metrics. Um, so m my question is, uh, maybe it could be P SWAP plus C or something like this. But um, so are there any uh, applications uh, that uh, would be enabled if a performance of the sensor was higher. Uh, was actually already mentioned that, for example, mag uh, magnetic sensor, if it's Pika Tesla, so you can uh, now do uh, MRI type uh, and a lot of other things. But are there any other examples of um, sort of an application uh, use of uh, or application within metaverse, some functionality within metaverse, which will be enabled by a high performance sense, assuming all other SWAP plus, plus C metrics has been solved. So the question is, if sensor performance was higher for, I guess, enough to sensors, right, on, on the platforms, what new applications can be created, uh, right? And, and I guess, what's that threshold? Um, anyone wants to take it first? It's a tough one. <laughs> well, I think I, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this in my talk, uh, and I don't think this is a really an image sensor audience per se, right? But but there are um, just intrinsically, you know, uh, use cases that are opened up when you have um, image sensors with much higher dynamic range, for example, than you can get today. Uh, in in uh, architectures that are very low power, okay, right? And and I think, you know, the next step in the evolution of our virtual and augmented reality glasses especially is to take them outside, right? And you encounter a whole new set of, of problems and challenges when you are operating, you know, in direct sunlight, for example. <laughs> um, and then you walk indoors or you walk into a, a shadow, right? And then suddenly, you have this this huge contrast, okay, in lighting across the scene. That's a very very hard problem to solve in the image sensor space. Uh, so I think you know one of the things that we have been working on, right, which I you know I think is public knowledge, right, is a is an architecture with image sensors, a digital pixel structure, okay, that does have very very high dynamic range um, with a very very low power consumption, okay, at reasonable resolution. So. It's the evolution of things like that that I think open up, to directly answer your question, open up use cases that are not achievable at this point in time, right? But are the next iteration, okay? I also alluded to in the talk improve, how improving inertial sensors, right? Um, lowering the, you know, left-hand side of the Allen variance plot, right? <laughs> uh, for example, uh, is, will open up opportunities for other subsystems, for example, right? The most uh, power-hungry subsystem that we put in our glasses is the display, okay? Uh, right? It's not the sensors, it's the display. That's the rate limiter. Uh, and, and frankly, if you can reduce power consumption with other subsystems, then you afford and open up a whole new set of opportunities, right, uh, that were otherwise not there before, so. Maybe to add on the, the inertial sensors, um, I think you, you touched a very good point. On one hand, if you uh, um, attach an IMU on your finger, you can be very, very tiny movements, which are ha very hard to catch. On the other hand, if you move your hand like crazy, you have a huge, huge dynamic range you have to cover uh, and with very low noise. And I think if you get better in having a broader range on the inertial sensors, this opens up new opportunities to really track our finger movement. We saw the gloves, and I'm pretty sure they also have a, a ton of IMUs in, in, in each finger. Um, this will improve the, the, the whole experience. Just maybe one last point to add. So, um, so you, I mean, we do have really good motion sensors, IMUs, uh, performance sensors today for hand and head tracking today. Uh, but you were mentioning about newer applications. So uh, one interesting application could be on the health side, like gait analysis uh, for, for, medical, for medical use cases or performing very precise surgeries uh, for, for the healthcare, which is soon going to come up today, right? So, so gait analysis for a person maybe having some kind of a disease would be very different from someone who doesn't have that. 
So very, you need very high precision motion sensors, but you also need some algorithms that can track those signatures very well. So that combination of software and motion sensors will further enhance your false positives or, or improve your uh, true positives, basically. So that could be another application. So maybe to add one more point, because when you when you started when you asked the question, I was like, okay, where do I start now? Because I think the question of performance is so important for every kind of sensors that that we have, right? So it, we mentioned the AMU. Uh, the other part in there is when we look at that reckoning, for example, again, not to use the camera uh, so much and so on. Can we, for if we improve improving all the performances of the AMU is so key. We're, we're looking about um, you know sensitivity error and so on, right? Uh, calibration and so on. Can we, um, if, if we improve that part, improving that part, if I will have the, the magic one right now and all those figures will be better, definitely we could do that reckoning for so much longer as Mike was mentioning before and I don't use that in the camera. Dynamic range again, uh, Mike was mentioning the uh, time of flight, kind, uh, depth sensors and so on. Of course, those are being taught for different type of applications where the dynamic range wasn't that um, important. But again, just looking into that part, Again, I can turn off the camera for more, uh, for more, the display for more time, sorry, the camera for more time, prob probably. Another thing that comes to my mind is, for example, pressure sensor. So right now, when we look at pressure sensors, we're, we're thinking about, um, um, you know, which floor do we are and so on. And we're, so we're looking still at a dynamic that is pretty slow. But if with a larger dynamic, of course, we can look at other use cases. Uh, am I in a room? Is there a door, for example, that is open or closed? And this can be, for example, talking about medical, right? For example, this can be in an hospital. And so I, I, I could understand just for that uh, simple information if something is happening where I'm doing a surgery and I need to pay attention. So I, I have more alert about the, the information and so on. Th those are just, you know, a um, few things that uh, you can do, but definitely performance enable always more more use cases that sometimes can augment the normal sense of a of a person just because I have I, I have more more I feel the world in a better way than I could feel by myself thanks to the sensors so that's um and, and, and I think this goes in, in every direction right? so the question was I think it's hard to answer because this help in every every if I have more performance I can do more definitely so from Great answers. Any other thoughts, uh, or we can take another question? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm Adam Malik. I work at the intersection of healthcare and consumer electronics. So thank you for great um, talks and discussion. Um, given you know my focus, uh, I have not heard any of you talk in details about the practical application of AR for blind people or people who are you know legally blind. Where I mean it's kind of a very obvious to translate the world in front of them using all the wonderful sensor you got into maybe, you know, uh, describing the world around you and using the sensors to avoid like your Tesla or others, you know, collision, for example. So that's one. The other comment I have, can you comment on po potentially the adverse effect of the metaverse uh, with regards to, as you all know, new generations are becoming attached to their phones do you actually see now, you know, more and more people potentially going to be kind of really using the metaverse as living in an isolation to a great extent and less collaboration? Yeah, thanks. Those, that's, uh, that's an excellent question, both of them. And I think they're, in my mind, in my view is that they're, they're, ascent, they're there's to some degree tied together, right? I think... Um, to answer your first question about blindness, we actually are we actually are thinking about that and and, and working on such things. I didn't mention it in my talk, um, uh, but um, it it's it sort of is a it's a good example of what we envision augmented reality to really be and what we mean by that, right? And at least what I mean by that is a um, is a world where you are literally augmenting your existing senses, right? It has to have additive value, okay? Right? It's not just about gamification. It's not just about entertainment. It has to have additive value, right? And, and I think we would be remiss if we were not trying to improve, right, upon the five or, as Andre says, the six senses, okay, uh, that human beings have. And that is, that is the definition of augmentation, right? 
And so we, so we are, we are uh, very cognizant of this and we're working on it. Um, you know, I have young kids and I have always shared this reluctance, right, about more screen time, being more immersed um, in a virtual or augmented world and what that means, what are the implications uh, for taking somebody out of reality, right? And so um, part of the reason I joined Meta is I felt like, you know, if you're a part of it, you can have an influence on where it goes, right? And so for me, this is very near and dear to my heart. And I envision a world where um, you are you are able to use your devices passively, right? And in such a way uh, that you can, can and should coexist with the reality around you. That's the idea. So it's immersive when you want to be immersive, but it's really augmenting the senses that you have in the real world today, okay? And I think, you know, I didn't talk about this necessarily or specifically in the talk, but this is really the evolution, right? This is part of the evolution uh, for the next, sort of the next uh, generation of phones, right? And tablets, right? It's, we, we sort of went through this first technological revolution uh, and we invented the phone and we didn't really understand, I don't think, at the outset, what were gonna be the implications? How were people going to use them and, and what were gonna be the pros and the cons? I think now we have a real opportunity, okay, to take that next step and figure out how to invent technologies that we can coexist with, right, uh, and with our fellow human beings. And that's, to me, super, super important. So I, I hear exactly what you're saying, um, and it is, it's something that we are, we are thinking uh, very deeply about. I, I agree with that. It's very interesting. You know, I mentioned the metaverse stands for all these companies come together. The first thing we did was ask them what was the most important issues and the most important issue that came right to the top. It wasn't any of the technical issues. There's a bunch of those. But it was safety, privacy, inclusiveness, diversity. I think it's what Michael was saying. We've, we've just gone through Web 2.0 and the mobile phones, and it's wonderful technology. It's enabling all kinds of fantastic things, but it also has a downside. I think it's for kind of fortunate timing, maybe. We've just gone, gone through that experience. We can go into what we want the metaverse to be a little older and wiser. The, uh, I think, I, I really hope the metaverse doesn't turn into a dystopian future where everyone is plugged in for eight hours a day. You see lots of people kind of promoting that, and. and respect to meta, I know, you, I know you don't want that either. But I, I think augmented reality is gonna be the, the thing that really liberates us because it, as people have already said, it brings us into the real world, it doesn't shut us off from the world. So my hope is on, on AR. VR is gonna be awesome too, you know, for training, for education, for the really immersive experiences where you want a short, immersive, high impact experience. I think that can be great. But I really hope people don't plug in for eight hours a day. Really, really great answers. Um, I see that we're almost approaching uh, our end, end of our time here. Um, maybe any closing remarks or any you know final words you want to get in uh, before uh, we take a break? Um, Ken, do you want to? Uh, say, some, say something, Ken. <laughs> Instantaneous closing thoughts. Um, let's see. Um, I, I think, you know, there were a lot of good, good points raised earlier. Um, and I, I think just, um, you know, we're always, when, when we're deeply immersed in academia, it's always what's, what's the new fundamental physics mechanism I can... I can look at and what's right. What's the what's the entire new field I can open up? But I, I think one of the things I wanted to, to emphasize, and I think got across pretty clearly here, is there. You know, there's definitely that absolutely has to happen. But at the same time, there are more than enough problems to to work on right now. Um, and so, um, you know, I thinking about ways you can make where are the pain points, right? And how, how can we give us an order of magnitude 
improvement in these pain points, right? Really taking a step back and thinking about the, the overall system, thinking about the challenge from a first principles standpoint, which academia has more of an opportunity to do sometimes than industry. Um, I think that's that's really something I would I would want to encourage everybody to to think more about is is sort of how do we address some of those issues that are we, we have plenty to deal with. So. Um, so, so what I really learned in this uh, last uh, um, two, two and a half hours is um, there are a lot of challenges and I think it was good to see in your keynote the whole spectrum because usually we as sensor guys, we live in our small bubble. We don't see the, the, the whole picture all the time. So it was good to get this reminder. Um, so so if, I, if I look back uh, in the sensor world, I mean, Bosch was really one of the pioneers in the sensor world in developing the deep reactive iron etching, which enables the sensor as we have them today. And now is the next switch. Now we come more to the intelligence. Uh, now we are adding intelligence to our sensors. There's also now a programmable AI uh, IMU out of the market. And this, for me, is only the beginning because we heard the world power a lot during this discussion here. So we have to next step is address the power. And then farther down the road, we have to add new sensors to enable new features. And this is what we all together have to work on. Uh, I totally agree. This can, no one can do it alone. So we have to work together to make it happen. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point, um, and I'll maybe I'll just finish here by saying, you know, I think within our group at Meta, you know, we don't just think about um, you know reducing swap C, right? When it comes to building new sensors, we think about uh, adding intelligence to sensors, right? For the reasons you stated, we think about uh, you know building new sensing modalities, hybridized sensors, for example. Okay, as the experiences become more complex. Uh, you know, the burden on the number of sensors increases, right? And we simply are going in the wrong direction, okay? And so it's important to think about um, how we can, you know, design and build sensors that can work across multiple features, okay? They can solve multiple problems at once. That's really, really important for us. And the, other, and the last thing I'll mention is something I mentioned in the talk, which is that you can improve a sensor in isolation, but it doesn't do any good if when you integrate it into your system, it no longer works, right? So this coexistence issue, right, which is, um, it's, it's not the sexiest issue in the world, but like it's, it's a really important issue, okay? And you know, if your IMU uh, you know, doesn't work because it's vibrating too much, uh, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big challenge. So I think when you're thinking about what you wanna work on, Okay, to contribute to, to, to the metaverse, and you're thinking about it from a sensor's perspective, think about how you can introduce multifunctionality into sensors and think about how you can make them coexist with a lot of these other subsystems. Okay, so, so those are the things I would, uh, those are the thoughts I would leave. Thank you, uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, a big round of applause for our panelists.